sometimes it's good to take inventory on our desires. Just stop and think, what is it I really want? What is it I'm looking for? What is, what are my goals, my aspirations, my ambitions in life? Usually that's something reserved for the younger people as they, you know, want to go to school, college, get a, uh, a good job and all that, and they have all these goals and aspirations. That's, as, as you get older, sometimes those things diminish because you've already run your course, at least partly, and uh, the goals are minimized. After that, you've already settled a lot of things, but we, sh we need to think about ultimate goals. And, of course, as a preacher preaching, I have to always refer you to the eternal goals. That's my job. One of the main jobs of the pastor is to keep people reminded that eternity is what really counts. Now, to, unfortunately, in many, many churches, eternity is a, an almost an ignored subject because everything's about what God can do for you now. And uh, I, I hear that. I, I'm always listening to preachers on TV and radio, and I want to hear a good sermon. And um, it's rare that you hear a pastor or a preacher who really preaches a God-centered message. Where, where the focus is on the Lord and not on, on what he can do for us, which is good. I mean, God wants to do a lot of good things for us. He wants to bless us. Jesus said he came to me that we might have life more abundantly, and that means now, if God had his way, we'd have perfect lives, of course. But God doesn't always have his way. He's set it up so we have the ability to go our own way. So as a result, we've got many, many folks who just wind up having problems and troubles, so this affects the ministry because they address those problems, try to help people, want to help people, want to encourage them, but it, it can easily slide over into the place where you're using the faith and using the Lord and using Bible verses or whatever to just make it all better now. And that's, that's not wrong, but it's not enough. Because the problem is the secret of making it better now is not to forget about eternity. Not to forget about God's purposes, God's plans, God's will. These things are vital to us. These are the things that are gonna last forever. And so the pastor has to be bugging you and reminding you uh, you're going to die. You're going to die. Everybody's come and gone, and we're going to come and go. It doesn't. It, we, it, for us now, everything is so vital, so important. We're like the only ones who ever lived, but we're just another generation or two or three that are going to be gone. Then what? Uh, Tracy and I were listening to Dr. Stanley, Dr. Uh, Charles Stanley, last night on the. I love him. He's a beautiful preacher. Um, faithful, solid, loves the Lord. His messages are alive. I, if, you, if you ever get an opportunity to hear him, if you haven't heard him or if you get an opportunity to hear him or watch him on TV, you should do that. He, he's on the radio. He's one of the, one of the best. And he said, he said something just offhanded. We said, well, we, we've got to put this on our sign. And it says, before you leave... Now, what did he say, Trace? I forget. How did it go? <laughs> when you die, make sure you know where you're going. I forget how to go. I can't. He says, when you, when you die, be knowing where you're going or something like that. It was really neat. But just a little phrase he threw in. But I, I thought about it and how important that is. Uh, and not that we want to think about dying. We don't want to think about death. We're not obsessed with that. But we never want to forget that this is temporary. And, and God is working out a, a, a purpose and a plan. So the point I'm making is that our goals, our desires, our aspirations really should be for what's best for us. 
And what's best for us is not to just use religion and the Bible and you know, scripture and preaching and all these things just so we'll have a better life now. In order to have a better life now, Jesus gave us the formula. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Now, the problem in America is we have all these things already. <laughs> so many, so many people have everything. We were so blessed, and that's, that, that's good, but it can be bad. So what, what, what is your, what's your most intelligent goal in life? What can, what's the most intelligent goal we can have in life? Or what is the most vital desire we should have in life? Uh, what should be our greatest ambition in life? Well, 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 why do you ask the question? Because what, what you set as your goal, your ambition, this or that or the other, determines the meaning of your whole life. So if it's all about money, it's money. If it's all about pleasure, it's pleasure. If it's about, you know, the next team that wins for you or, or you know, whatever physical pleasure, if it's food, some people live to eat, <laughs> you know. I mean, so it's amazing how small some people's goals can be in life. Just one day at a time, one thing at a time. Can't wait to go out and do this or do that, or and, and life just goes, and there's no deeper, and life takes on a very shallow meaning, and people can get excited about those shallow meanings, but, but there's something better and deeper, and the point is that this better and deeper is the best thing for us. It's good for us. It's what we need desperately, and what it is, it's so simple. God has set it up. He said, I work everything in the life of a Christian. Now he's talking about Christians here, people who know him, people who surrender to Christ. They've asked him to forgive them, come into their heart, and their trust in him as their savior. That's a, that's a deal, that's a done deal. It's like getting married, you either, you either do or you don't. So you either come to Christ or you don't, or you, you come or you haven't. So when you've come to Christ and you belong to him, everything changes, and he begins to, to refashion our desires at the deepest level. And the, the reason he does is because he wants us to desire the ultimate good for us. Not for him, he doesn't need anything, but the ultimate good for us. And all that to say this, the ultimate good for us, is to become like Jesus. That's, that's what God's after. He says, I work all things together for good to those who love him, those who know him, those who've surrendered to him, in order that they may be conformed to the image of his son. So the, God's number one goal in his number one desire, his number one ambition for his children is for their best, which is what we are and what we become, not what we get and what we have. You see, so he's dealing with the deepest part of us forever, forever. That's all that we're taking with us when we leave. We're not taking our earthly successes none, no matter what they are. They're fine here, that's good, they're God's blessing, but we've got to keep the balance. These things can just make us forget that we have this incredible privilege to become like Jesus. And one of the ways that we've been talking about lately about becoming like Jesus is his prayer life. Prayerless Christians are powerless Christians. They may be Christians, but if they don't have a life where they pray and they stay in touch with the Lord, not 24 hours a day, but they, 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 they pray, they take time and really consciously have a relationship with God, it may, you may not feel it, it may not affect your emotions, 
but in your mind you believe he's there and you talk to him as if he's there because he is there and he's listening and the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on the behalf of those whose hearts are committed to him. So he's there listening and we need to be in touch. He is the source of spiritual strength, life, love, joy, peace, the real stuff, not the earth's type, not the world's kind, not the, not the slap happiness of the world, you know, not, not the cheap joys of the world that come and go and you need more and more to get less and less like drugs and not the, the love of the world which is mostly lust, love is only as good as the person doing the loving and, and if people, people can have selfish love, lust, love, all mixed, and, and no peace, very little peace. But God has offered us the real thing, a, a deep awareness of eternal love that never feels. Ever, I've loved you with an everlasting love, agape love, New Testament. And the joy that is, that's, that, and the peace that, that is beyond comprehension. You can have it in the worst circumstances. And this is all what God offers. And, and, and you know, we do live in a tough world. So we need help. And we need his strength and grace. So the greatest goal, the greatest desire, the greatest ambition for us as believers Always, the dominant desire should be to become more and more like Jesus. Now, what does that mean? Well, you think about Jesus, you think, oh, well, he did miracles, he preached, he did this, he died on the cross. Yes, all that is right, but, but that's not the issue here. The issue is character, it's spirit, it's attitude, and goals and desires. That's where we become like Jesus, inwardly like Christ. We don't look like him. We don't try to act like him. We don't know how he acted. We, it's inward, it's, it's, a, it's a state, a condition, and how beautiful it is. So we need to see. Now, one of the greatest ways that we need to become like Jesus is in this matter of prayer. We, we need to learn from him, and he teaches us by precept, words, principles, rules, suggestions, whatever, and example. And so we're gonna look at the example part. The Bible doesn't give a lot of examples, but it gives a few very significant examples. The Bible's busy, the New Testament Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are so busy telling us all the things that Jesus did because he did so much. But it's interspersed along the way are these lessons and these examples of his prayer life. So we wanna look at his prayer life. We already said a week or so ago that, I think it was maybe last week, that the first record of his praying was at his baptism and he prayed for the anointing of the power of God upon his life he already he not only was he filled with the spirit from his mother's womb like John the Baptist but he ha he is the spirit his his spirit is identical with the spirit of God so so he, he was you can't say he was praying for the Holy Spirit he was when he reached 30 he was then he knew that he was then ready to begin his ministry. Up to then, he was just a carpenter of Nazareth, really helping rear his brothers and sisters. But he was the oldest, and so he took the place of the father. And then when they had reached a certain age in God's perfect timing, Jesus was around 30 years old, and God said, okay, now it's time for you to do what you came to do. Being a carpenter was on the way, being a surrogate father was on the way but now you're here for your purpose and his purpose of course was to be the savior of the world the savior of the world what a what an order 
What a task, the savior of the world. He was called, and here he is, 100% human, born in the likeness of sinful flesh, yet without sin, that's amazing. He, the likeness of sinful flesh means that this, he got tired and weak and hungry and bled and died. So he had a body and it, it, was, it was limited to this world. Just like you and me, he had to play, play by the same rules. And one of them was the law of prayer. That's why he prayed all the time and uh, showed us how. But meanwhile, he it now goes to be baptized and prays for the special anointing, supernatural power to do the signs and the wonders that proved his words. Now, you know, if he, if he said, I'm the son of God and uh, I've come from eternity and uh, my father in heaven sent me and I'm going to go back to my father. If he said those things that never did a miracle, you know they'd laugh him out of town. And like I said before, even though he did miracles, they still didn't accept him. But, but the miracles, for those who would believe, they could see that these signs were all good, always for the good. And they were, they were definitely miraculous. Even his enemies said he does these miracles, but they said he does it. They couldn't accept him, so they said he, he does it by the devil, which was horrible to say because they kept saying it. Jesus said, you'll never be forgiven because you keep saying that, attributing to the devil, the work of the Holy Spirit, which is terrible. And, and so, but the Lord Jesus did these wonders and miracles, but he didn't do one until he prayed for the anointing of the Holy Spirit at his baptism. That's what Luke says. He prayed and the Spirit descended upon him. Then he could do the miracles as the Father led him step by step, day by day, moment by moment. He never showed off. He never made a big deal of it. He just did them to prove his point. I am the light of the world, so he heals the blind man. I'm the resurrection and the life, and he calls Lazarus out of the tomb. The miracles proved his, who he was, but he got that power through prayer at the baptism. The second time we see him praying is in uh, Luke chapter 5, where he, he just was going along with his disciples. He just called his disciples, and they run into a man who is full of leprosy. Now, now, leprosy is a horrible disease. Everybody knows that. There have been wonderful missionaries and doctors and good people who have gone to minister to the lepers, and some of them wound up getting leprosy. For many years, there was no cure. Uh, recently now they have quinine and stuff that can help, but still it's a dreadful thing. It's been minimized in the world by God's grace, but, but in those days you were done if you got leprosy. If you had leprosy, you had to wear something over your mouth so nobody would ever uh, get any of your breath on them. Not that they could catch it that way, but that's one of the things. You, could, you were totally ostracized from your home, your family, society. If you got near somebody, they could stone you if you were a leper. Lepers had to walk around, and if there were a bunch of people around, they, have to, they would have to say, unclean, unclean, unclean. It's the most humiliating, debilitating disease of the time. I don't know, I guess there was cancer back in those days, but leprosy was a big problem. So he runs into this guy who's full of leprosy. It's not just a few spots here and there, or not fingers disappearing. This guy's totally, and the implication is that he's dying. It doesn't say that, but, but full of leprosy, that's fatal. And he sees Jesus, and he makes this wonderful statement, he says, if you will, you can make me clean. <laughs> that is faith. That is some kind of faith. Now, he obviously must have seen some of Jesus' miracles or seen something because you don't just get that out of nowhere. He said, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus said, I will. 
and he touched him, which was unheard of. You know, he touched him, and instantly he was clean. Like people couldn't believe their eyes. This is, this is some kind of spooky stuff. This is supernatural. It blew their minds when he did things like that. And he was totally clean. Now, here's the kicker. Jesus said to him, okay, I don't want you to tell anybody. <laughs> and that's interesting. What a difference between him and the modern evangelists who, you know, advertise. He says, I don't want you to tell anybody. Why? Well, the crowds were, and, and, and if somebody heard that and saw that, the ones who saw it, it was enough. He said, if you spread this around, I, I won't be able to do anything. And, and the guys, I don't know if he said, okay, but he went out and blazed it abroad. <laughs> He couldn't, he couldn't keep quiet. He said, this guy healed me totally. And it was so, the crowds got so big that Jesus, you know what Jesus did? It says, he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. <laughs> well, he went and hid and began to pray. And, and the, the language there is, in those days, he was doing this whenever he had an opportunity. Whenever he could, he would let his disciples be occupied or sleep or do something, and he'd take off and go pray. Every time he had a chance, he would go get alone with the Father and pray. It's like prayer was the most important thing to Jesus. He did this on the basis of the fact of his total humanity. He had been the Lord had become a human being 100%, living under the same principles and rules we live under, and the law of prayer is there. You have not because you ask not. Ask and you shall receive. And he lived by that. He, he had God the Father in the Son, through the Son, became one of us and lived like a human being and had to pray. And if he had to pray that much, where he felt like he had to take off and pray every time he had a chance. Well, I can understand that. You don't have to be like that. You don't have the ministry he had. You don't have the job he had to do. So, so you don't have the same uh, needs and pressure. I mean, he was under tremendous pressure, but that it ought to show us that we, we do need prayer and we should be living under the uh, circumstances of knowing that we have not, if we ask not. And we go along struggling, trying to do this, trying to do that, and on our own, and it's difficult. So he prayed with, he habitually drew aside and prayed. And then he came back out, of course. And then the next time we see him pray, he goes up to a mountain. And it says he, the sun was setting and I think we can believe that he had a heavy heart because he had just gone, he'd done a bunch of things, healed some people, had a, bu a bunch of people healed, and, and he, he particularly went into the synagogue where he loved to go and teach. And while he was teaching, a, a man in the synagogue interrupted him and shouted out, and said, we know, we know who you are. I know who you are. You're, you're the Holy One of God. And, and it was like he was accusing him of hiding it. That's exactly the meaning there. I know who you are. You're the Holy One. What have you come to torment us? This guy was full of devils in church. Do we have people in church that can be full of devils? <laughs> you know it. So this guy demon driven and he's right there worshiping in church with everybody else and and uh and jesus of course casts the demon out the next time he goes into a synagogue and there's a a fellow there with a withered arm and the far he looks over and here's all the religious leaders sitting there in all their fancy clothes and uniforms and all the stuff they wore to show people who they were holy, holy. And they're over there watching him and he can just taste their hate. And they're looking, they want to catch him doing something on the Sabbath so they can accuse him. So he says to the, he, he says to the, 
guy with a withered arm. He says, come, come here. And the guy comes out and he, and, and, he, and he maybe puts his hand on his shoulder. I don't know. I'm just, you know, at living here. He says to the, to the religious leaders, he says, what do you think? You think it's good to save a life, to heal or to do something evil and like kill on the Sabbath, which is what they had in their minds. And then it says, he looked round about on them with anger. That's the only place it says that in the Bible about Jesus. He was angry, but it tells you two things about anger. One is how you handle it, and two, what's the motive? And how he handled it was he just looked at them. He didn't say anything. He didn't chide them, jump all over them. He just looked at them. They got the message. And then it says he was grieved. He looked about them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. Grieved for the hardness of their hearts. So anger on Jesus' part was a holy anger. He was grieved. He was grieved and it made him angry that they were so hard-hearted. And it says, now that's, that's the right kind of anger. Then it says, they went into a rage of hatred to destroy him. And the word for, for the anger that they had is anoai, which means they lost their minds. It's like they were out of their minds with anger. So he, he said, okay, stretch forth your hand. And the guy stretches his hand forth and it's, he's made perfectly whole. Then immediately after that, he heads to the hills to pray. <laughs> need to pray. These guys want to kill me. They hate me. There's all this horrible, I'm going to go hide with my father and pray. And then he just poured out his heart to the, to the father. And Luke says, he just started to pray and pray and pray. And he prayed all night, all night. All day he worked, all day he's doing all this stuff, casting out demons, doing this stuff. And then and now he didn't go, instead of going to bed, he goes out and he prays all night. The next day he's on the scene, ready to start over. The last point is that Jesus sometimes, and I have to end with this, prayed with great joy. And there's only one record of that, but I'm sure he did it more than once. It says, Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. And he said, Father, I thank you that you've hid these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them unto babes. For so it seemed good to you. No one knows who the Son is but the Father and who the Father is but the Son and who the Son will reveal. And, and, and he, he was rejoicing so, so Jesus wasn't just a prayer warrior who was struggling and there were times when he rejoiced in the Lord. There's a mixture and our prayers always ought to have an element of joy somewhere. We need that because when we pray, we're usually praying for problems and burdens and heartaches, but we need the joy of the Lord mixed in with our prayers. More next week, let's pray together. Father, thank you for our dear Savior and his wonderful, beautiful prayer life and how it is there for us to see and to aspire to and to ask you to help us receive it and be like him. We pray in his name. Amen. With the sound of strange symbols and heart, we praise you. We praise you with the timbrel and dance and shouts to you, Lord. We praise you, we praise you with new songs from our hearts, our worshipful.